Some men just want to watch the world burn. Welcome once again, my fellow manipulators of digital fate. I'm Richie, this is Capricorn. Today's deck is a doozy, and if you're watching it the day it comes out, it is the start of Outlaws of Thunder Junction spoiler season today, and I am up super late. Uh, If I look tired, I apologize. I'm up super late trying to record this intro to make sure we can get this deck tech out live before I dive headlong into spoiler season because I have a ton of spoiler, spoiler season content coming. And I just want to make sure this deck gets out before I dive into all of that because things are going to get crazy and you guys need to see this deck first. This deck is called Y2K. And what we're doing is we're going down the rabbit hole, continuing to find ways to punish Boros Convoke and all these other aggro decks that are just so annoying on the ladder, right? But surprisingly, we found a deck here that also does really well against control. And the idea here is it's Sweeper Tribal using an oldie but goodie and a new win condition that just apply unending pressure and advantage that just no matter what, we can just keep applying pressure and just completely decimate the opponent while just sweeping the board every time they get you know, more than a couple creatures out. They can just never build up enough of a board presence to kill us, and we can just eventually get there with our win conditions. It's kind of wild, um, and it works super good against control too because we have these win conditions that are just reusable, that can, that provide continued advantage, that just kind of like snowball and take over the game. So I built this deck to be really good against aggro, but it's surprisingly good against control too, and I'm actually really, really excited about it. I think this might be... I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I think this might be like a real contender for just trouncing the meta right now. But anyway, before we talk about the deck, I know I rambled a lot already about the deck. Before we talk about the deck, make sure you like, make sure you subscribe, do all the things. Uh, The channel's been snowballing. We have a ton of new subscribers. If you're new, let me know in a comment down below. Thank you so much for checking out my channel. I appreciate you. To all my oldies but goodies, I appreciate the hell out of you as well. Speaking of which, I want to give a shout out to my patrons over at patreon.com slash quarantined Capricorn. That's Yuck Fuzzy, Hector, and Kalen at the Brew Crew Elite tier, and then Marlac at the Brew Crew tier, and then of course our forever CPU savior, Terrence Rohrbach. You guys are the lifeblood of this channel. I say it every video, but damn it, I mean it, and it's true. Thank you for your contributions. Now with all of that out of the way, I do want to reiterate... Outlaws of Thunder Junction spoiler season is starting today. We're going crazy with spoilers. So if you're watching this, make sure to check out the spoiler content. I'm going to link up above and down below uh, so that you can check that out. Things are getting wild. We're going to check it out. It's going to be crazy. So many cards, so many mechanics. Standard's about to be super nutty. But uh, first, we got this crazy deck to get through. So put all of that on hold. I stream Monday through Friday over on twitch.tv slash quarantine Capricorn. If I'm alive and I'm breathing, I'm there and I'm streaming. And every Thursday is community night. This Thursday is going to be crack-a-pack because we got our sub goal over there for the week. Which means if you beat me, you win a pack of magic cards. We open it on stream. We see what you got. Send me your, uh, your address afterwards and I mail it out to you on the first of every month. So if you want to whoop my ass in magic and uh, maybe win some packs... Uh, yeah, head on over to Twitch. I'll see you on Thursday. Let's check out this deck. You know, I thought I got it out of my system with the last deck, with Ripper Knot, uh, you know, getting rid of Boros, making sure to wipe the floor with them. But, really, I just can't get enough. That deck just needs to die, and really any aggro deck in general just kinda needs to go away at least when I'm up against them. So that's what this deck does. But it also works surprisingly well in control. And all in all, this deck is actually way better than I expected it to be. So 
First of all, the idea here is it's a sweeper tribal deck. We're running so many sweepers, we just constantly sweep the board. Boros can't keep their creatures on the board. Any aggro deck can't keep, keep their creatures on the board. And even a lot of the mid-range decks just can't seem to keep any board presence on the board, which is awesome. Um, we have two really good win conditions that pair really well with that strategy. The first being an oldie but goodie, Urabrask's Forge. Comes down for three mana, makes an X1 Red Phyrexian Horror creature token uh, every turn with Trample and Haste. Uh, equal to the number of oil counters on the forge, and it gets an extra oil counter every turn. So we've seen this card before, but basically it makes a bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger trampling creature every single turn. Um, what's great about this is we can just keep sweeping. If we could just get forge onto the field, and then just sweep every single turn that we need to, it doesn't even matter if we kill the creature token because it's going to die at end of turn anyway, and then next turn the forge just makes another token. So... In a way, this is almost like a growing creature that dodges our sweepers, which is super, super important. It's a perfect win condition paired with a bunch of sweepers. Uh, but now we have a new win condition to put alongside it to increase our win cons from 4 to 8, and that's Cryptic Coat. Cryptic Coat comes down for 3, cloaks the top card of our deck, uh, and then that thing can attack as a 3-2 unblockable creature. So not only is Cryptic Coat uh, great with sweepers, but it's good even if the opponent has blockers down. Like a couple of chumpy 1-1 one -one blockers like Boros Convoke tends to always have, right? This can just swing right through them, maybe for a couple turns until we get our sweeper online and then sweep the board. And then when we lose the creature to a sweeper, it doesn't really matter because we have this other ability on Cryptic Coat where we can pay two mana, bounce it to our hand, replay it, and just cloak another card off the top. So every time the creature dies, we can just bring it back, replay it, get another one. Just keep doing it, eventually our opponent runs out of gas. And that's why this works really well against control as well as aggro, because we force them to use up all of their spot removal on all of these cloaked creatures, even though we can just keep making more over and over and over again and not really lose any card advantage. Uh, and when you're up against control, it, being in a situation like that where you're not losing card advantage and you can just kind of grind out the game is exactly what you need to do to win. So this deck, because of all the sweepers, which we'll get to in just a minute, is super good against anything aggro. But like I said earlier, it's also really good against control, uh, way better than I expected it to be, because it just puts down threats that are really hard for control to deal with for the long term that eventually just get there. Um, let's, let's start at the bottom of the curve here. Actually, you know what? Let's talk about the sweepers first. We've got four Brotherhood's End. This is because it's a three mana sweeper. Uh, it can deal 3 damage to each creature and each planeswalker, or destroy all artifacts with mana value 3 or less, and sometimes that's relevant. We're running this because it comes down on 3. It's probably the best turn 3 sweeper that can hit the most things uh, that we have access to, so we're absolutely running it. And then in the 5 drop slot, we have 3 hostile takeover which allows us to turn one of our creatures into a 4-4, one of theirs into a 1-1, and then deal 3 damage to everything, which is super important because if we do happen to have a creature on board that we want to survive, we can make sure it survives. Whereas now, even though we're mostly sweeping the board of lower toughness creatures, at the very least, Hostile Takeover can make sure that that best creature on your opponent's side that might be really big is gonna also die to the sweepers. So the Hostile Takeover is actually really good in this deck. Uh, I think it's underutilized in Standard and there's probably a good reason for that because the card pool is so huge that there's just better options. But in this deck, I think it, it slots perfectly and I'm so stoked to use a card that is kind of underused that you don't see pop up very often. So really, really good addition. And then we're running that alongside the three copies of Burn Down the House, which can deal five damage to everything. This thing can kill a Shieldred, which is really, really important. And again, most of our win conditions, they're all dodging all of, the, all of these sweepers, which is really nice. But if we're up against control and we don't need to wipe the board, and some of these, you know, board wipes might be dead cards in our hand, Burn Down the House isn't. It can just make three 1-1s one -ones with haste that all ping when they die and just get extra pressure onto the board and put extra pressure on the opponent. So this card kind of helps this deck be good against control or be better against control than it otherwise would be. 
Uh, and then in the four drop slot, we've got one invasion of Karsis, which can come down and three, deal three damage to everything. And then uh, if we manage to flip it by doing four damage to it in combat, which is actually kind of easy to do with forges and coats, um, it will become refraction elemental, four, four elemental, Ward pay two life, and whenever we cast a spell, it deals two damage to each opponent. Sometimes that can be a win condition. Uh, the reason we're only running one of these is because we're also running Beseech the Mirror as another four drop that can search out any card and put it into our hand, or search out any four drop or less if we bargain uh, and just play it immediately. So we can sacrifice like a token off the forge or a few of the other cards that we'll get to in a little bit to just you know, bargain, cast, beseech the mirror, and if we need our Karsis, we can find the Karsis. Or if we need our final sweeper here, Phasing of Zalfir, we could find that too. This is four mana saga, chapter one and two, you phase something out for as long as uh, this saga remains on the battlefield. And then on chapter three, you destroy all creatures, and then for each creature destroyed, you create a 2-2 black Phyrexian creature token. Now the reason why this can be especially good in this deck is because we're generating creatures like Urubrask's Forge that are just going to die uh, at end of turn anyway. Or we're doing things like playing Case of the Stashed Skeleton, which I'll talk about in a little bit, where we make a creature that we want to die anyway. Well now we have something we can fetch that can not only wipe their board, uh, but also replace our expendable tokens with better long-term tokens that will actually stick on the battlefield. So sometimes that can be really, really relevant. Uh, and it's also worth noting that when we destroy their creatures and replace them with 2-2 Black Phyrexians, now all of those creatures that, that they have are within range of all of our sweepers. So if they are playing a deck where they have a bunch of big creatures that are too big to kill with our damage-based sweepers, uh, we could just turn them all into Phyrexians and then sweep. Um, it is a little bit convoluted, it takes an extra step, but it's a nice little extra thing we can do if we're in a pinch, which is nice. But what's really good about this card is we can also fetch it if we just need to phase something out. We can start this on chapter one if we want, phase something out for like two and a half turns. And sometimes if we know we're going to win in the next couple turns and we just need these key permanents off the field, having this alternate mode to use the phasing of Zalfir for is really cool. And then we can also kind of phase out our own stuff to save it from the phasing of Zalfir when, when chapter three triggers if we want. So there's a lot of versatility with this card. And I just think it works better in this deck than in most because of things like the forge tokens where we get extra value off them dying and turning into these two two Phyrexians. So we're gonna run one. We can search it up with the one Beseech the Mirror if we want. So a lot of these one drops feel like two drops because of this Beseech the Mirror. Or, or not one drops feel like two drops, but these one ofs in the deck feel like we have two of in the deck because of Beseech the Mirror being able to fetch any of these that we might need. And we'll get to the other tutor targets in just a bit. All of these sweepers are doing one thing, with the exception of Phasing a Zalfir, they're all sweeping with damage. And there's a couple important reasons for that. We're gonna start at the burn, uh, beginning of the curve now, and we'll talk about the first one of those good reasons. We're running Case of the Gorgon's Kiss. Now, a lot of times what, we're wanted, what we want to do with this is just play it on one. It comes down and what it does when it enters is you destroy any one creature that was already dealt damage this turn. Um, sometimes we're not even just going to take advantage of that. We're just going to play this on one and just get it out there and not care. Um, but to solve it, three or more creature cards were put into graveyards from anywhere this turn. And then once it's solved, it flips into a 4-4 four, four life uh, lifelinking death touch creature, which is kind of bananas. So the idea here, we just get it out on one, and we forget about it for a little while. And once our opponent has three creatures onto the field, and then we wipe the board with one of our sweepers, now all of a sudden the case is just there, and it just flips right into a 4-4 four, four lifelink death toucher. So... In a way, it's like we're just playing a 4-4 four, four lifelink death toucher for one mana. We just kind of have to go through our sweeper uh, shenanigans before it comes online. But it's still a 4-4 four, four lifelink death touch that only costs us one mana to get on the field. So we can set that up pretty easily in this. Uh, and it's also worth noting that I'm not sure why this works. But the way it works with Cryptic Coat, if we cloak a card from the top 
and that card is not a creature on its front side. It is a creature now because it's cloaked. And so if that thing dies and goes to the graveyard, as long as it's a card in your graveyard and it was a creature when it died, it counts as a creature dying for Case of the Gorgon's Kiss because it's important to note that to solve this, three or more actual creature cards have to be put in graveyards. It can't be tokens. But since the cloaked creatures are not tokens, they are cards, for some reason the way the rules work is it actually counts it, uh, which is kind of wild. So even if we say cloaked, I don't know, a virtue of persistence or whatever, uh, and then that that cloaked creature dies and the virtue goes to the graveyard, it's going to count as a creature card being put into the graveyard, which is kind of crazy. Um, but it works, and it helps us flip, flip case of the Gorgon's Kiss, which is really nice. But also, all of our sweepers are damage-based, which I've already pointed out, with the exception of that one phasing as Alphir. So, the, the ability when this comes into play to destroy something that was dealt damage this turn actually goes way up in value in this deck too. If we happen to get a case of the Gorgon's Kiss like top deck a little later in the game, uh, we can actually use it to take out a huge threat like an Atraxa or something like that after sweeping the board of all the little stuff with one of our, our damage based sweepers and then just for one mana playing case of the Gorgon's Kiss and killing their biggest thing that also happened to have been dealt you know a few damage. So. It's very versatile and can do a lot. Not only that, but it's just sitting there and sometimes if we can't get it to flip, we can just use it as fodder for like bargain for Beseech the Mirrors. So there's just a lot of stuff this can do in the deck and I think it's a perfect inclusion. We've also got four case of the Stash Skeleton. This gets a 2-1 Menace uh, guy onto the field that can't block. And then when it's ever, if it's ever gone, this will become solved and basically turn into a Demonic Tutor. Um, really good in this deck because we can just put some early aggression on the opponent and if we're up against control we just want to keep that aggression on them right follow up case of the stash skeleton with a coat or a forge and just keep putting pressure on the opponent uh, with our win conditions but if we're not against control and we're playing like aggro or mid-range eventually we sweep and the token dies while we sweep which then turns this into a Demonic Tutor so that we can get extra value after the sweep and find whatever we need to follow up the sweep with. So it kind of works in different ways depending on the deck that you're up against and it works really well on e in either of those functions. So super good inclusion here. It's also worth noting that the token itself or the enchantment can either one can be sacrificed to beseech the mirror to bargain it so there's even more potential there it's not really what we want to do with those cards um but if we need to the opportunity is there we're also running four virtue of, of persistence as our other two drop uh key removal that's going to help us survive against aggro until we get to our sweepers which is really nice kill something gain some life but then it's also a win condition in the late game because we have so much control and so many sweepers um, we drag out the game with value and just always sweep whenever our opponent gets too crazy and then eventually we get seven mana so we're actually using the the normal seven mana version of virtue of persistence way more often in a deck like this when than we otherwise might um, and it just adds to our win conditions um, and gives us so much card advantage after already using it as removal in a deck like this. So it is the perfect conclusion as well. Uh, moving on, we already talked about most of the three drops. We've got the, the four Brotherhoods and the four Cryptic Coats, the four Forges, but we're also running one Kaito, Sh Kaito Shizuki um, because it just works perfect with the deck. If we attack this turn, uh, the plus one will draw us a card and we don't have to discard. Uh, which is really nice. It's really easy to trigger that with our unblockable, you know, cloaked guy with cryptic coat or our forge token. So that's really good. Um, and then there's some extra value baked into the Kaito as well. And then in the four drop slot, we have a couple other things that we can search out with Beseech the Mirror here that are good targets. The first of which is the four drop Kaito, Kaito Dancing Shadow. So for four mana, it comes down as a three loyalty planeswalker. Whenever one of our creatures deals combat damage to a player, we may return one of them to its owner's hand. And if we do, we get to activate the abilities, the loyalty abilities of Kaito twice that turn instead of once. Being able to draw cards, being able to make it so that their creatures can't attack or block, 
Uh, and then being able to make these 2-2 two, two drones by down ticking for 2, uh, that when they die drain for 2, all of those abilities are really, really good. But what puts Kaito over the edge in a deck like this is there's a, a few different ways to use his static ability that make him just super good. Uh, with Urabrask's Forge, we can just swing with the Forge token, and then the token's gonna die at end of turn anyway. So if we bounce it with Kaito to get extra loyalty abilities, we're not really losing anything. So in that way, it's almost like we get we get to activate Kaito's loyalty abilities twice a turn, kind of for nothing. We don't even really have to do anything to do it. We just get rid of the token that's already gonna be gone anyway. <laughs> so that's super cool. And then we can also use it really well with Cryptic Coat because we can swing in with whatever we cloaked with the coat, unblockable, so we know it's gonna connect, and then after combat, since we connected, we can then bounce the cloaked creature to our hand, and then once it's in our hand, it's the spell again so that we can cast it as whatever spell it might be. And in this way, if we end up cloaking things that aren't creatures that we can't flip over, you know, say we, we cloak a burn down the house, right? we can return that creature after it connects to our hand with the Kaito so that we actually have access to playing Burn Down the House. So there's just a lot of value baked into that. And honestly, it really makes me want to use even more copies of this. But we do have the Beseech the Mirror. So we're just going to stick with one for these tutor targets just so we can include the most diversity possible uh, and increase the chances of having you know better targets for the right circumstances that pop up uh, when we cast Beseech the Mirror. So, just one Kaito. And then we also have Barbed Servitor, because what damage-based sweeper deck is complete without, you know, a stuffy doll-style card? 1-1 one, one Indestructible for 4. Since it's 4 mana, we can search it out with Beseech the Mirror if we want. And uh, when it comes into the battlefield, you suspect it, so it will have Menace and it can't block. But whenever it deals damage to uh, a player in combat, you draw a card and lose a life. So it's card advantage, it's indestructible card advantage, and whenever it's dealt damage, target opponent loses that much life. So sometimes we could just get the servitor onto the field, and then all of the sweepers that we're playing afterwards, since they're damage-based sweepers, are just going to do damage to the opponent's head as well. If we Brotherhood's End and deal 3 damage to everything, not only do we sweep the board, but 3 damage hits the Barbed Servitor, it survives because it has Indestructible, and then it hits the opponent for 3. So, same thing with Burn Down the House for 5. There's just so much value to be had with the Servitor, but you have to be in just the right circumstances to take advantage of it, because it's not a very defensive card. It can't come down and block. It does take a full four mana. You kind of have to be ahead before you play this to really take advantage of it. So it's not the kind of card you can just jam a bunch of in the same deck because it's a little risky. But in a deck like this, we can play one and be able to tutor up with Beseech the Mirror. And don't forget, we also have four other tutors in the deck in the form of Case of the Stash Skeleton. So there's actually a lot of ways to find our silver bullet targets, which is really nice. But uh, yeah, this is the deck. I kind of love it. I I've always loved Kaito. And there's just so many cool things that this deck is doing. And I think it's primed to actually deal with the meta remarkably right now. It deals with Boros well. It deals with Mono Red well. And like I said, it holds its own against Control surprisingly well. So a lot of dual lands. We need the dual lands. We are running one Mirex. Uh, and yeah, that's where we're at. The game's... You, you just got to see the game. So I'm going to shut up and we're going to take a look at those right now. All right, this looks pretty good. We'll keep it. All right, we're going to start with the lounge. Be nice to get the spire out, but we're going to go with the lounge. We'll do cliffs and case. This deck's even good against control because even though it has a bunch of sweepers... It's got a lot of cards that, like, are difficult for Control to deal with. Let's see. I think Kaito is probably best. We really don't want to play that second case of the Stash Skeleton until the first one's gone. Because if we have two, they can kill one of the Skeletons and we don't get any value. We don't get any tutoring because there's still a Skeleton around. So we want to force them to deal with one at a time. Alright, we're going to draw 
We attacked, so we don't need to discard. Another case of the Gorgon's Kiss. Not too shabby. Wandering Emperor. Is he gonna exile it? He scoops! Uh, let's see. We have no red mana. Two slow lands. I think we got a mulligan it. This is better. We'll keep it. Toss back the expensive thing. So we can play Murex in case of the Stash Skeleton. I think I'd rather go like this. I think we'll just play Case of the Gorgon's Kiss. That sets us up with three mana worth of plays that we can play next turn. This turn, no. Alright, do you have a counter spell, sir? Yes, yes you do. Alright, this is very sad. We're up against control. Uh, and we've got two very wasted cards against control. Yeah, we're just we're just gonna do this. We have nothing to kill. Oof. Pass the turn. We'll make a Mirex token. We'll just try to win with Mirex tokens, I guess. That seems fine. Field of Ruin. Uh. Okay. We still made a Murex token, bro. Do you has Counterspell? If it's another make disappear, it's not going to be enough because we got that fifth land. Cut down. Okay. That's something at least. But if you can't deal with the forge, there's an inevitability to the forge where we just win. That's why it works so well with uh, so well with sweeper base decks. Because as long as we just keep the board clear, this just eventually wins. End the turn. We'll hold on to our Virtue for now. If he gets out something like a Lazav, we can kill it. Hey, speak of the devil. Speak of the devil. Although, we're going to swing first. Because who knows, he might be dumb enough to block, and then we don't have to waste our removal spell. Counter spell? Do you has counter spell? No, no you don't. Alright then. It's looking pretty good, <laughs> not gonna lie. Much better than I expected to look against control. I guess we just, our win conditions are really good against control decks. Especially ones without artifact removal. Okay. Grabs it with the bat. Has to grab the takeover though, right? Oh, it doesn't. He doesn't grab the takeover. <sighs> what do we want to fetch here? 
we could fetch anything. We could fetch Kaito. We could fetch Barbed Servitor. Alright, we're gonna bargain, we're gonna sack one of these boys, we're gonna grab Barbed Servitor. This card advantage is sweet. Do you have more removal, sir? Ledger Shredder. Oh, all right. Then. We are going to try to swing. It's got menace. It's got menace, friendo. How menacing. Let's draw a card. Ooh, look at that. Honestly, I think I want to keep his creatures on the field for now. We could trigger this case of the Gorgon's Kiss. That seems wonderful. I don't care what he flips. For the throats, my skeleton. Wow, okay. Oh, he's gonna grab our takeover. That's a bummer. It's okay though. We'll solve the case and then we'll get another one. We'll wipe his board. I'm not worried. Are you worried? Because I'm not worried. Hi. I hope that last card's a counter spell. I mean, I don't. I don't literally hope it is. I actually hope it isn't. God damn it! Ugh. Now I gotta give myself the whistle. I deserve it. Let's be honest. All right, we are solved. So we'll just find another sweeper next turn. Oh baby. That's not quite enough, buddy. We gotcha. We're about to absolutely wreck his day. Absolutely wreck his day. Kill a four toughness and a five toughness. So we need burn down the house. Oh my god. Take five from the servitor. Give me all my shit back. Swing. Draw a card. Flip my case. Dude, let's go. Let's go. That's what I'm talking about, guys. I want your stuff now. Now that all your stuff is dead, I want it. We're gonna start by swinging. We'll gain life from the Gorgon. 
We gain enough life from the Gorgon to make up for the one life we lose drawing the card off Servitor and the three we're going to lose to the Unblock ability. Bananas. Alright, we're going to play Virtue of Persistence. Why is he looking at my- don't look at my graveyard, I'm taking your stuff, buddy. We're playing Sweeper Tribal. I'm putting your stuff in the bin so I can steal it. Alright, we got a three lander here. It looks kind of perfect. We're going to keep it. Not perfect, but really good. Defin definitely what we want. We're going to start with the Marsh. We'll play uh, Sulphur Springs on two. Probably case of the Stash Skeleton. We could kill the Berserker, but I don't think it's worth it. So we'll hold off. I think we're just going to get down some board presence. Case followed by Cryptic Coat give us gives us five power worth of things that are really hard for him to deal with. That can just end the game super quick. All right, Haywire Might. All right, going to sack the Haywire Might to get rid of the case. I am I am down. All right, Cryptic Coat coming out to play. We're going to swing to, what do we grab? A Black Cleave Cliffs? All right, Tyvar comes out. Let's make it a Millie we can win. brings back the Haywire Might. Hmm. Just do this. Alright, so Tyvar dies. We get him down to 17. We're winning the race. And we sort of have more card advantage. What are you going to do, ABBA Matrix 88? Destroy my Cryptic Coat? Sure. We still have the Forge. I think arguably the Forge is actually a bigger threat right now. And you're going to draw a card? Wow. This guy is greedy, huh? Super greedy. We're going to do this before you can draw. And then we'll play this. And then we'll swing for six. Seems fine. Seems super good. Oh, you're a roots deck, are you? We're just gonna have to kill you quick. Another Haywire Might. I believe he just got that with the Seed of Hope. Come on, Abbey Matrix. I don't think we sweep. I think we just go like this. Make three devils and just smash in for a ton of damage. Just be really aggressive. All right, we go to four. That might be game. Kind of has to kill the forge, right? But even without the forge, things are looking wild. If we phasing of Zalfir replace all these with tutus, good God. That would be gross. Think we got him? All right, all right. We're not, we're not quite there yet. Really? 
You're supposed to block first. That's how that works. Uh, let's just do this. And then we'll go like this. And go straight to chapter 3. Wipe our board, get a bunch of tutus, and ping him to death. Seems good to me. Alright, this is pretty good. It's not perfect. I would like a third land, but we've got some early plays. We've got an early sweeper. Definitely a good hand. Definitely keepable. We'll start with the lounge. We'll go turn two case, most likely. If we were up against aggro, it would probably be virtue. Case makes the most sense here. And then we should be able to follow up the case with the cryptic coat. Just put a lot of pressure on our opponent early. Like, they can't deal with our skeleton without giving us a ton of value. And it's super hard for them to deal with the Cryptic Coat creature because of the ward, because of the unblockable. And then even if they do deal with it, we just return it to hand and make another one. I think that's better than playing out the Kaito. I think uh, putting pressure on the opponent right now is preferable. Even though we could have drawn a card off the Kaito without discarding because of the attack from the skeleton that turn. Which would have been good. But I really think just putting a lot of pressure on the board, on our opponent, forcing him to have to contend with our board state, is uh, it's kind of better right now. Alright, he's got four mana. Are we going to jam Kaito next turn? I guess it depends on the top deck, right? What did we grab with the cloak? In case of the Gorgon's Kiss. Wow, okay. He's gonna spend his whole turn killing that guy. Alright, now we're gonna Kaito. Draw a card. Alright, next turn we can bounce and replay the Cryptic Code if we want. So if we're in a position where we still just want to keep putting pressure on the opponent and we don't draw a better card, I think that's the probably that's probably the play. Ooh, tear ass. Mr. Mosswood Dragon. We're gonna swing. We're gonna draw a card. Thanks. I'll be taking that now. We're gonna kill this guy. And even though we're already past our combat phase, I still think it makes sense to play the forge here. If we can just keep upticking the Kaito and get to that minus seven, that would be really strong. I know exactly the creature we can hit with it. And against this deck, that would be kind of perfect. Alright, another Tear Ass. Dread Knight. Hey, it's that creature that I would have hit. <laughs> Alright, hit for two. We'll draw another card. Play the Barb Servitor. Now we get card advantage online. And they can't really block it or they just take a bunch of damage. So as long as we stay in the lead and we stay aggressive, uh, this guy's really good.
Come on, Narasima. Show me what you're working with. Show me what you got cooking. Let's go. I'm waiting. My calculations are correct. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious shit. Fine. I did top deck a case though, didn't I? Let's see, what do you got in here? No creatures for me to grab with virtue. I think it's still probably worth it though. Discard a Brotherhood's End, since we obviously don't need it. I'm just going to play out the Virtue. And we're going to solve the case of the Stash Skeleton. We could have played out this case, it was tempting, but if we did, we don't solve the first one. So now we can use the Virtue of Persistence to pull the Barb Servitor back out. Restless Cottage. Sure. Ah, oh, eats our servitor. That hurts. Would have had me if I wasn't so fast. Let's find something. Let's find something we can we can win with. Hmm? Five. If we can do five damage to Planeswalkers, we can kill the Wren, so burn down the house would be decent. But is there something better we could do? Kaito. Guess we'll just do it. It is gonna kill our Kaito though, right? Yeah, that's unfortunate. In fact, maybe it was the wrong play because of that specifically. I think if I had grabbed a forge, I could have Brotherhood's End dealt, dealt three, brought Ren down to two. No secret I can't uncover. Yeah. We're gonna do that. Kill the cottage. Get run down to two. Play another case of the stash skeleton. And pass the turn. We'll hold on to the case of the Gorgon's Kiss for now. It might actually be useful. Since he's Golgari, he has the potential to get out some really big threats. Topiary Stomper. All of this is fine. Makes it 3 3. That's fine. Kill the Kaito. We're just gonna burn down the house anyway. If only there was one more creature out before we did it. If only. that 
play that. Doesn't make sense to play the case yet. We'll end the turn. Alright, case's stash skeleton is now solved. Can we afford to hunt down a win condition? Topiary Stomper. We're gonna grab his Topiary Stomper. No basics. Our one basic is on the field. Unfortunately. Alright, let's uh, crack the case. We need a win condition in a big way. I think we're going to play Kaito. One, two, three, four, five. Chances are that thing can't can't swing, right? Let's just draw a card. Hold up Ottawara. We'll pass the turn. If we're desperate, we can Ottawara, which is nice. The thing here is if we trade Stomper for Stomper, then we just have another Stomper in the yard that we can get back with Virtue of Persistence, so it's kind of good for us. We just want creatures in his yard at this point. But if we can get one more creature onto the field, like an actual creature card, like this Mosswood Dread Knight, we can sweep and then flip the case of the Gorgon's Kiss, which would be really, really nice. Five, four. Let me think. One, two, three, four, five. We could have another five mana. We could do that. We could do that. Not good enough, right? Alright, we're gonna swing. It's gonna take the damage. How do we kill everything without killing our Kaito? I don't think we can. We can kill all of his stuff, but that's not going to flip the case. I guess we could go like this and then like this kills the stomper, flips the case, and we keep our Kaito. And then we have a bunch of creatures in the yard that we can now get back with Virtue. 
so that's probably good. Go for the throw at the case, sure. Lost with Dread Knight. I want you. Cancel. We're gonna go three one ones, and we're gonna uptick the Dread Knight, and we're gonna smash for three, and we're gonna bounce one to our hand, and then we're gonna draw a card. We'll play the Cryptic Coat. And I think that's it. We'll end the turn. Dread Knight can't attack or block. He's down to four. I think we're in pretty good, a pretty good position here. Show me. We're just like pushing our way through all of his control. And it's wild. We have a Terror Tide. Probably doesn't even matter, right? Six? Yeah, I guess six matters. We keep the Cryptic Coat. We've still got Virtue of Persistence. We keep the Kaito. I think we got him. Deadly cover up. Sure. He's got to be very careful about what he exiles. Do we get back the Dread Knight just so that he can't draw off of it? It's tempting. We got pings from devils. We just need to hit him for two more points of damage. Makes sense, man. Let's return this and play it. Case of the Gorgon's Kiss. Play you. Draw a card. Uh, pass turn. I think we got gotcha. you. It's a lot of cards in your hand, but I think we got gotcha. you. Come on, Narasima. Show me. Show me. Show it to me. Show it. You can tell I'm getting tired. <laughs> I'm a little overtired. It's fine. Everything's fine. Everything is fine. Overlook. I've overlooked nothing. Swamp. Sure. We've got more creatures to just keep getting back from his graveyard, which is really nice. <sighs> We've got a trampler. He's trying to gain some life. It's kind of rude. We're going to bounce it. Sweet. Dread Knight. Oh, he's dead. You toast, buddy. You toast! Toasty! 3D! Alright. This is a bit of a slow hand, but I think it's okay. We're gonna keep it. We got Cryptic Code on 3. No matter what. 
It's just a matter of what the hell is happening before that. Not a whole lot. <laughs> Not a whole lot. Candy trail, sure. jam the coat or the forge. I think we need the coat because we really just need to like hold off the opponent right now. We could beseech the mirror next turn. Find the sweeper. Which would be really strong I think. We'd have to sack, sack our cryptic coat though. Probably worth it though, now that we have a Sir Ginger in play. Swing three. Unblockable. And then we will... Beseech the mirror. Sack the coat. And we're gonna find Invasion of Carsis. That should get the job done. Carsis wipes the board. Down to just two cards. Seems pretty good to me. If we could just get down the servitor, draw a land, we'd be in a very strong position. He's digging with the trail. He's digging. He's really trying. Well, there's our fifth land, so we can Servitor. And then we've got Burn Down the House Hostile Takeover on top of the Servitor. Like, that's... that should be game over. That's kind of wild. Oh, wow. He's just still digging. That's kind of bananas. We're gonna play the forge. Here and here. Alright, well, just get our win conditions online if he's not gonna play any creatures. There's a Fron. There's a Blood Tithe Harvester. Schooner. That's that's fine. I will totally race you, bro. Take three. Play the forge. All right, we'll swing our tokens at the Carsis to flip it. And our servitors going at the head. Draw a card. And now we should be set up. I mean, without any extra pump. You can't really swing with the schooner because we have a 4-4 four, four blocker. He could swing with the vents, but he's only getting in for two if he does that, right? 
and it's going to take a lot of his mana, so he does have an anvil now, and that's not nothing. But I mean, we got two forges and refraction elementals online, so it's pretty wild, man. Good night. Take that. And take this. And take this. And take this. So I'm at three, we draw a card, we go to six. Let's see what he can do. It's possible he could kill us here. He can drain for one, so he just needs to get in for another five. Oh, I think he did it. I think he did it, guys. He did! He got us. He got us because of the anvil. He deserves that win. Like, that's wild. Good job. Good job, Dr. Fasalier fac Faculty. Sure. This hand's a bit slow, but it's really good against aggro. We'll keep seven. If he's playing aggro, we should be pretty good shape. If he's playing control, we're going to have to draw into some gas. Well, it looks like we got some Boros here. Brotherhood's end on three seems good. We've got enough mana to get to hostile takeover on five as well. Can we just play the case? Nah. We don't need to. Unless he plays three creatures right now. Okay, we probably should have been. Should have seen that coming. Evangelist. Alright, we're absolutely going to have to light the board here. He's going to be left with a bat, but it's fine. It is what it is. Slow him down. Big ol' slow style. Another crag. Let's see, we got Inspector. We need him to have three creature cards. I think he wants to crack the clue. That's probably fine. We're gonna play this, and we're gonna play this because we know we're using the hostile takeover next turn, right? With a little bit of luck, he'll play two actual creature cards, and we'll get to flip our case of the Gorgon's Kiss. There's one. Give me another one. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Insult to injury. Let's go. Let's go. We don't even need this thing to die. Alright, you're a 1-1. One, one. 
You're a 4-4. Four, four. Swing 4. Flip the case. Goodbye, Boros. Boros, more like Snoros. Am I like? Am I? Am I right? Can you guys tell I'm tired. It's uh, it's the middle of the night. It's like 3 a.m. <laughs> and I'm up here trying so hard to just get some games, get this deck tech out. Uh, but we're doing the damn thing, so. It's wild. But yeah, I think I think we got him. With the lifelink online because of case. She's so good. This is so good. Let's draw a card. And if it gets out of hand again, we can Brotherhood's End, wipe the board, it doesn't even kill our case. It will kill our skeleton and then turn on our, our stash skeleton, so. Uh, turn on our demonic tutor, so to speak. Even my overtiredness will not get the best of me. Too bad they don't have haste. Do you have the hasty guy in your hand? That'd be pretty good. Oh, well, he's got some hasty. Not enough, though. You got no buff, friend. You've got no buff. Zero buff. Do a little bit of that. We'll do a little bit of this. We'll do some of this. Right? Get some of that in. Do we play it or do we cycle it? I guess we cycle it, right? Alright, solve the case. We're still at 19, he's at 3. We've still got our 4-4 death touch lifelink. Like, let's go. Boros, you got nothing on us. Absolutely nothing. Good night. Good night. That was nice. It's all in the reflexes. Thanks so much for checking out my channel. I'd like to give a huge shout out to all of my patrons over at Patreon. Without you guys, this channel would not be possible. So honestly, thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of your contributions. If you haven't yet, like and subscribe. The more likes we get and the quicker we get them, the bigger this channel will grow and the faster it will grow. I'd love nothing more than this channel to become something very special for you guys, but it's entirely up to you how fast that happens. Also, if you'd like more deck text, that's somewhere over there. And if you'd like to see what else the channel's been up to lately, that's somewhere up that way. Also, subscribe, circle below, do all the things.